that. Great. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we are going to get started here in probably just a few minutes. We'll make some time for uh, folks to file in. But thanks uh, to everyone for joining us and uh, settle in. We'll get started as soon as we can. Okay, welcome again, everyone. Uh, we'll get started here in just a, a moment. I'm going to go ahead and um, make a, a brief introduction uh, for our speaker who's going to be uh, talking with us this evening. Uh, at the end, we'll have some time for uh, Q&A. There is a, a Q&A section here within Zoom that you can uh, put questions into. You can put them in at any time during the lecture, but we won't. Uh, probably take any of those until the end. But uh, uh, thanks to everyone for joining us. This is actually our fourth of five uh, alumni spotlights through the course of the week. We kicked off the week with a Master of Industrial Design alum, uh, then a Master of Landscape Architecture alum. Yesterday, we actually had a, a couple of folks presenting for the Master of Interior Architecture. Today, we have a Master of Architecture alum, and then tomorrow we'll conclude the week with a Master of Visual Communication Design uh, alum presentation. Um, uh, we have a number of folks uh, registered for the meeting today, including uh, some current students, some prospective uh, graduate students, uh, and a number of alumni and local professionals. So welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm particularly excited for uh, this evening. We have Rachel Green Rasmussen, who is uh, a 2009 alumna from our Master of Architecture program. Uh, and prior to that, Rachel was, I believe, a 2006 alumna of our Bachelor of Science in Landscape Architecture. Uh, and Rachel has been working, I believe, at Architecton uh, since you graduated and is now a principal at Architecton as of 2019. Uh, Rachel also just completed a term as the president of the Phoenix Metro chapter of the AIA, the American Institute of Architects. And so this year she'll be serving and supporting uh, Allison Rainey, the, the now president of that chapter as the past president. Uh, and I'm sure she's gonna tell us quite a bit more uh, through the course of uh, her talk today. 
Uh, when I reached out to Rachel to ask if she might uh, give a talk, uh, the, the call was really an open one to talk about uh, projects that she's working on, uh, uh, to talk about her career arc, to talk about what the transition from school to practice has been or, or what she's seeing in practice. Uh, so I'm excited to, to hear the talk and I will leave the, the intro fairly short and turn it over to Rachel. Rachel, thank you for joining us. Rachel, I actually can't hear you. I'm not sure what, what happened to the audio. This might work. I have to use my little AirPods and sometimes they disconnect. Can uh, you hear uh, me now? Yep, I can hear you now. Thanks. It wouldn't be a video call without a mute incident, right? Exactly. <laughs> All right, thanks, Rachel. Take it away. Well, thank you again um, to Phil and team. This has been a great series and I'm honored to be a part of it. So really appreciate it. As Phil mentioned, uh, a two-time graduate of ASU and Bachelor's of Landscape Architecture and then Master's of Architecture. And what I want to hit on mostly today is um, how that relationship and that background has kind of informed um, my career path and the projects that I've worked on. So I'm going to kick it off with just a couple of photos and I want you to all just kind of take an immediate inventory of what your initial reaction is when you look at these photos. Um, how do you feel? Do you feel stressed? Do you feel happy? Um, and what your, your initial reaction is when you see them. And I'm landing on this um, last kind of image and the, the point here being that, you know, we study architecture and um, we very historically have talked about the building and uh, all too often, especially in school, students are presenting projects where it's a, an object building with a, on a flat surface. Uh, and the places where people really live and engage and first connect with a piece of architecture is really the site around it. And so my personal exploration has really been about elevating the connection between the site and the building and how you can start to push that relationship and make them more equitable. One of the examples that I always like to pull out is obviously the High Line. People really, really focus on the success of this project um, as a piece of infrastructure, green infrastructure in the city. Um, this is an example where even in our most densely populated cities, we really have acknowledged the need for a relationship to nature and the impact that that can have on the human psychology. And while this is a really phenomenal piece of architecture in itself as the High Line, um, I think the, the example of the juxtaposition of how the buildings relate or lack of relationship they have to the High Line as they have grown around this um, piece of infrastructure in the city is something that's really poignant. Um, there's, a, I would say 90% of the buildings have a very slippery relationship to the High Line itself. Um, they don't engage it at all. They tend to be these object, shiny object buildings that are kind of placed down adjacent to it. Um, and very, very few actually pay tribute or engage or even acknowledge uh, this piece of infrastructure that snakes through the city. This is a photo of our office and I like to pull this up because it's um, the reason I think I found such a great home at ArchitectCon is because the psychology of our culture there is very much in, related to the space that we work in, uh, the connection to the daylight that we have flooding the space the greenery that we've incorporated into the um, into our desk space and how that really stimulates our creativity and something that we really we we like to walk the talk or talk the whatever <laughs> walk the talk um, and not just you know spew it to our clients but also live it and engage in it ourselves. So some of the projects I'm going to hit on today I'm going to use these almost more as case studies of how on various scales, um, 
our work has looked at the incorporation of uh, nature, um, everything from the physical incorporation of landscape into the materiality of the building, uh, the views to nature and surrounding areas, the connection to daylight and water, uh, and then the importance of the psychological impact on the occupants of the building. And that's ultimately why we do this. Um, many, many studies um, that I will pull up as well um, have done the research. We know for a fact that views and relationship to nature with, from within buildings creates a better environment and nature makes people happier. And we at Architecton feel very, very strongly about why we design architecture and that it's for the people to use. And so ultimately that relationship is very obvious uh, and critical in the success of the project. So I'll have a number of kind of quotes up here. Um, I can actually get, if anybody's interested, the, the research data um, to fill and he can kind of distribute that if you'd like. Um, but the research shows that because of our, our evolutionary past, right, we are inherently connected to nature. We see nature as the structure of beauty. Uh, and we also, it also psychologically creates um, serotonin within our minds and then also um, just happiness in general within uh, the buildings that we occupy. So our first project we're gonna go through is the Maricopa County Southwest Regional Courts Facility. This was one of my earlier projects um, that I was able to work on um, from a design standpoint. And it was one in which we were very fortunate because the client really immediately understood the value of connecting to views, connecting to daylight, connecting to nature. Uh, we talked very at uh, length about uh, the value of the reduction in stress that they can have on the occupants. Um, what we're talking about is this democratic access to views and democratic access to daylight um, for both the visitors and the people that work there. This was really important because in a courthouse, it's a very stressful environment for both the people that are visiting as well as the people that work there day in, day out. They have a lot of security concerns at courthouses. So very often they resort to a very enclosed structure that lacks daylight and lacks views, um, creating a much more stressful environment, creating more conflict between the employees and the visitors. And so by connecting to nature and connecting to daylight, we are able to reduce that amount of stress and create better interactions um, and better service for the people that visit the space. Uh, this is an example of a judge's chamber, a very often a very, very secure location in the building, um, no access to outside daylight um, views typically. And so what we incorporate here was kind of bouncing some light in from the um, from a Claire story up above so that they still not necessarily direct views, but still have natural light in their space, um, again, creating reduced stress in their environment. This would be the back secure corridor. Again, a, typically a very dark and dismal environment that we wanted to enhance and create a much lighter and a much uh, happier place to be. So another example would be how this has been incorporated into education. This has probably been the one that's studied the most. Um, there's been studies dating back to the 1970s showing that you know, access to views and daylight increases test scores, increases attendance, increases productivity. And so this is really, really critical and we approach every uh, educational project uh, that, we, that we dive into. And that, you know, we, I think our biggest challenge is that in these spaces that you're looking at here, these are study spaces. It's a lot easier to create a much more open environment. When we start to get into the classrooms, we get a lot of pushback from um, the instructors because they're concerned that too many windows create too much distraction. And so what we did on this project was um, we created a map and looked at various ways that we could incorporate daylight into the classroom without creating a lot of distractions. 
And this is an example of a glare study uh, that was done that was about maximizing the daylight into the space without creating a lot of direct daylight. And by, and by utilizing that second skin that you can kind of see on this south facade. So we tuned that second skin to bounce as much daylight into those classrooms as possible, but without creating too much direct views to the outside um, that people were concerned about in terms of distraction. And as, as well as on the south facade, a lot of direct daylight coming into the space can create a negative daylight effect in terms of glare. Um, so we worked actually with an ASU master's student in the School of um, Sustainability to do this study, which was a really fun endeavor. And then obviously enhancing uh, the spaces that you can connect. This is on the north elevation. And so we have a lot of wonderful ambient light coming into the space. So really capitalizing on the spaces that you don't need to protect as much um, and creating a lot of access to the exterior. And then of course, the ability to, in Arizona, create a lot of spaces on the exterior. So education spaces where people can gather. Um, this is actually a screen so people can plug in and that, that technology exists where people can gather on the outside of the building. So having that direct connection to nature and creating those environments on the interior and the exterior of the spaces are really something that we try to carve into every project. This would be the auditorium. So this is another example of a very strong direct connection um, to the exterior. So this is an example of an event um, where we have the screen uh, in a blackout situation. They drop this curtain at the end of the presentation. This all goes up and they can filter then out to the exterior space as a breakout space. This being on the north elevation of the building, it's fully protected year round. And so we don't have the challenge of a lot of direct daylight coming into the space. We create, we make sure that the infrastructure from a technology and power standpoint all exists on these, at these outdoor classrooms as we call them as well. And creating elevations where it's very easy to use the building materials um, for projection surfaces so that you can have an outdoor gathering and presentation space as well as the indoor. On Scottsdale Community College Indigenous Scholars Institute and um, Business School, this was a really unique experience. This was a project that was about giving back to the Native American community, um, as well as creating a new home for the business school. So it was really about merging these two cultures into this building. Um, the, the Native American community that we worked with, SRPMIC, uh, they feel very strongly um, about the connection to nature. So this quote, I think, speaks very poignantly to that in terms of how when you incorporate nature into your sense of self, you then view harm to nature as harm to yourself. And that has been spoken about as having negative effects um, in terms of the, the depression or the stress and anxiety that can result in terms of when we talk about climate change that people feel a lot of anxiety about that as a result of their connection to nature. On the flip side, I think you look at this as an example of a culture and a community that's, been, that's felt this connection for, as, for much longer than any of us have, um, and it's embedded in who they are. And as a result, the connection between the building and the landscape is critical because it's such a part of who they are. So we took it a step further on this project and not just looking at um, how we can view nature or allow daylight into the space, but how the building and the landscape itself can be really one in the same and embedded and within one another. So we are really fortunate on this project to work with local landscape architects, um, Colwell Sheeler. And um, when you have that kind of partnership, you can really create these wonderful magical spaces. And so what in this instance, we burned the landscape up about three feet around the entire perimeter of the building. Um, and that works twofold. It creates this really wonderful connection when you're seated next to the window at eye level, you can look out and see that relationship with the landscape. It also helps to insulate the building. It reduced costs on the skin, um, not having to fit out the skin at the, um, the full height of the building. So a lot of benefits that we found from doing this um, 
this move. It also paid tribute to historically to the way the roundhouses were constructed and berming the land up um, around, which is where that kind of initial idea stemmed from. Rachel, can I uh, pause you just for one second? We've got a yeah. couple of notes in the chat that there uh, are some folks who are seeing a, like a black bar or a gray box in the middle of the screen. Could we try to maybe? Oh, okay. Maybe it's this. Might be this. Is that gone? You, no? I think we still have it. Maybe try exiting full screen and then coming back in. There, now it's gone. Well. Let's, uh, yeah, try jumping right back into full screen and maybe maybe that'll fix it. Is it back? I think we're good. Okay, I'm like, I don't have anything here. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay, no, no worries. I'm glad. Thanks for letting me know. Um, so on, on this project, we also then wanted to play off of the idea of when the building can kind of become the landscape, landscape can become the building and how you start to blur those lines. Uh, and so we took this story of the saguaro cactus and the idea of the saguaro cactus being human-like and having the human-like qualities. Um, and so the saguaro ribs of kind of old dead, we didn't destroy any saguaro ribs in the making of this. Um, they were donated to the project and approved. Um, so we cast those all into the concrete facade. Some of them were pulled out, some of them were burned out, and some of them remained in place. And the idea with the burning was about kind of the releasing of the souls um, of these saguaros. And the end result is this really, I think, beautiful textural quality on in the um, concrete that really speaks to that kind of blurring the lines of a material that's very harsh traditionally in terms of concrete, um, but how it becomes this very soft kind of textural landscape element that then pulls itself into the building. And so that that relationship um, extends beyond again the the kind of traditional kind of looking out at landscape or putting a planter in the building, um, but how you can kind of elevate that um, and move move to the next level. This project was always also um, very much about water. SRPMIC is a community that is about there the, the two waters um, about the two rivers and they're actually two tribes that came together. So the idea of this dual relationship of water was really important to the project. Water is a really scarce element in our, um, where we live in Phoenix, obviously. Um, and we wanted to celebrate that. We try to celebrate that on most projects that we have. Um, and uh, this, in this instance, the bottom right shows a rain event where the water is coming down these copper scuppers and then floods out into the landscape. And the landscape design pulls that all the way around the project, um, feeding all of the trees and all of the landscape through the rainwater. In addition, we wanted to talk about our dry season and our other kind of what we were calling our other wet season um, of air conditioning and pulling all of the condensate from the air conditioning units and creating this beautiful weeping wall that Colwell Schiller um, detailed in the end uh, and that was really about celebrating kind of those that little bit of water that we pull out of the air um, particularly in the later months of the of the summer ultimately I think the most successful parts of this project um, and the real beauty of this the, this project was about again, that engagement of where the building and the landscape end and begin. And the idea that that connection to site and that connection to landscape is so much more than, um, and, than just a physical relationship, but it's also a very strong psychological relationship and creating those spaces around the building where people can gather in groups of various sizes um, and have classes or have the uh, continue that oral tradition that the um, Native American community is built on uh, is really important to the project. Helios Education Foundation headquarters. This is a project that is 
um, just finishing construction. So we don't have a lot of photography on it, but I did want to pull it in because um, this is an example of a project. I'm going to talk specifically about one element of it, um, and that's the parking garage. <laughs> it sounds very bizarre. Um, parking garages, if you think off the top of your head, are very sterile, stark, um, dark, kind of sometimes scary places uh, to be. And when we first met with this client, uh, one of the first things that they they said to us was that, you know, the experience of well, being feeling welcomed and um, coming to this building really needed to happen right from the car, right from the get go. Um, and so we had spent a lot of time and a lot of energy talking about what that meant and how we could enhance that underground parking structure uh, to, to make people feel that way and feel welcomed and feel sometimes even maybe wowed um, about being in that structure. Ultimately, that relationship really came down to the landscape elements. Um, this, again, was a team effort with Colwell Sheeler. Uh, it's great, when, again, when you have a good team. Um, and so that the development of where the building ends and the landscape begins is, is it's a very cohesive process. Um, everything from bringing in that daylight, those views to the sky, all the way down into the parking garage, to the greenery that comes into that space, um, really creates a lovely welcoming uh, space and a welcoming environment. So as soon as people come in, they feel at ease, they feel welcome, and they ascend up the stairs and, and to their final destination. You can kind of see from this Cross section. Um, this was really much, very much about um, perforating this ground plane as much as we possibly could in various ways. So, from the parking structure up, sometimes just up to the courtyard level, sometimes all the way up to those views of the sky, as I showed you, and then vice versa from the upper levels of uh, this office space down into the courtyard and down into even the parking structure. And then using elements um, that connect all of those things vertically, using the landscape to tie where it pulls into the building, using the berming again to create those differentiation of space. Uh, and then ultimately using this really phenomenal um, three-story water feature that pulls the water um, down from above all the way down into the parking structure. And the current project that's under construction um, is Arizona State University ISTV7. Um, ISTV7 stands for Interdisciplinary Science Technology Building. This is the seventh one on um, ASU's campus. Uh, the idea really being that it's all about creating an environment where many people are coming together. When this project was first brought to us, um, we knew that it was discussed as being kind of the living room of the Novus Innovation Center, where the research park for ASU, well, not park, sorry, the research corridor and the Novus corridor really come together. And so it was really about being that central hub um, for those, for those um, two people coming together. A lot of research about the global um, future of the planet the Global Institute of Sustainability is in this space. Um, the Institute of Human Origins is in this space. So we talked a lot about how it's about looking at our evolutionary past all the way to the global future of how humans will continue to exist on this planet. And knowing that um, an exploration into the idea of biomimicry was really, I think, a critical element in how we designed this project. Um, Everything from the idea of how the massing occurs to how the skin ultimately got developed. So the skin, you know, we talked a lot, I talked on um, one of the other projects about the orientation and really capitalizing on different orientations. Uh, on this project in particular, you wanted to kind of take that to the next level. And so we really started to dive in um, we were teamed with Grimshaw out of New York on this project, and it was really fun kind of teaching them about the desert, um, showing them these plants that they've, some of them have only seen in Dr. Seuss books, um, and really um, 
they really got excited and really jumped on board with the idea of understanding the the qualities of the cactus, for example, the the self shading qualities of the cactus in this example, how the saguaro and specifically um, if you have to replant it, you have to mark which way is north because you need to make sure that you plant it the same direction, uh, otherwise it will die. And the the self shading, how it changes on each elevation. Um, is something that we just ran with uh, in terms of the skin here. So every elevation of this building, um, this kind of um, very textured, very self-shading skin um, moves around the building and is different uh, depending on the orientation in terms of um, maximizing daylight while shading as much as possible, working very closely with our engineers do a lot of analysis in terms of how we find that delicate balance between too much light and too much heat. Taking that kind of a step further, um, when we looked at the actual building and the massing and the site, uh, we really kind of jumped in. This is this hot outside environment. So this is where we were talking about that skin of the cactus and uh, the ribs and really capitalizing on that idea of the self-shading. Um, what we have on the inside, obviously, is a lot of program, and then ultimately the collaboration in the public space that each program wanted to have kind of a front face and a front door um, and retail their program within. So when we start to look at that and we start to make that relationship to the cactus and the idea that if you take a cross section of the cactus, you have this rough, rugged exterior, um, and then we have the the, the program or the spines that really create that structure. And then you have the kind of gooey center and that's where the, um, the water and the nutrients and all of the life that, that the cactus lives on, um, that's all where that exists. So really when you start to take that and start to talk about like folding it in itself and creating this kind of protective gooey center, uh, that's where we landed in terms of the massing of the project. We did a lot of analysis and shaping and sculpting this courtyard space, making sure that we had enough daylight for plants to grow in there, uh, making sure that the cross breezes are such that they leave out the really, really hot wind that we get sometimes in the summer, but create enough of the cooler breezes and the cross ventilation that we can get in that east-west direction. So this was ultimately kind of taking again that idea it's not as far as biomimicry can go, um, but it's definitely the next evolution for, for our work and, and really analyzing um, what we can learn from um, something such as from biology, something such as the cactus and, and apply it to the buildings to create a much more um, appropriate building for our desert environment. So this is the what we will refer to as the e-lab. Um, it's the courtyard space in the building. Uh, it was really important, again, like I said, that we create enough, sh enough shade that people wanted to be in that space, um, but enough light that trees and plant material will grow within that space. Uh, there's a strong connection here between a lot of the program spaces and how they can spill out into this uh, e-lab space. Uh, the labs themselves can actually pull out and showcase some experimentation that they're doing um, on ca carbon sequestration, for example. Uh, so creating this as kind of an event plaza within the space and balconies that exist at each tier that create this multi-level um, presentation space. And then using, um, we have an existing canal on the site and really how we enhance that to create a, a, a cooling effect within the space. Um, using the idea of the psychology of cooling colors, the sound of water, uh, the rustling of trees to um, psychologically make people feel cooler in the space as well as the shading and the cross breezes that physically cool the space down. Uh, so looking at all of those aspects together to create that kind of central um, space within the, the ELAM. And this is the kind of ultimately the corner of university and rural and the, the building that is intended to be there. And so you can kind of see here where we have a much more open facade on the skin 
uh, and we have much deeper shading elements on these on this east facade. And if you, it's actually under construction right now. If you're in town, you can kind of drive around it. Um, you'll start to see we're starting to uh, install the um, panels on the south facade now. So you can very much see the difference uh, between the east and the south. Um, so it's something too that we are um, planning to track. So I think something and something we did at CAVC as well, College Avenue Commons, um, is that it's really important to note that, you know, we're always learning. I, I've taken these things from school, um, both my bachelor's degree, my master's degree, merged them together, constantly evolving and learning and trying new things and trying to implement um, different ways of merging the idea of site and building. Uh, and so as an idea of learning, we are using kind of sensors throughout the building so that we can go back and track how the buildings are actually functioning. And so we know, you know, we really thought that this was going to work better than it did, or we thought that this wasn't going to work so well, but it worked really, really well. Um, and so all of these things that when you work for especially a university that's about innovation and experimentation, um, that this building itself can actually be a lab um, for the, the Global Institute of Sustainability. And with that, I am open to questions. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Rachel. We've already got uh, three questions that have come in. Uh, the first question that we got is from Mallory Payne. Mallory did her undergrad in our uh, pre-professional architecture degree, uh, took a year off uh, to work and is now in her first year of the MR program. And her first question is, what do you think was the key to your success and rapid career trajectory? And it's a three part question. What advice would you give to students transitioning into work and pursuing fair compensation? Uh, and then the third part is, do you have a favorite project or one that you feel was pivotal for you? All right. Well, I think the key to anyone's success um, whether rapid or not is staying hungry and staying eager and always wanting to push yourself. Um, for me, you know, I, I don't like to sit still. I don't like to settle. And so um, my favorite thing to, to ask her to say is that there's got to be a better way or how can we do this better? Uh, and so that constant exploration and not being afraid to put that those questions out there um, and and be a part of the conversations and be a part of the discussions, even as an intern. Um, presenting your ideas and asking questions and, and being a participant in your career, I think is really what's critical and not um, kind of waiting for it to be handed to you. Um, advice on transitioning into work. Oh, and pursuing fair compensation. Um, know your worth. <laughs> um, I think that I, I haven't seen a lot locally um, challenging in terms of people finding fair compensation. Um, but the I know nationally that it's a much bigger issue. Uh, I think we're very fortunate here um, in our architectural community that we really value the people coming out of school. Um, I would say that no matter what that you you know, it's funny, my mom was in human resources forever and she, anytime I had a job interview, she always told me that, you know, to make it clear what you can offer them. So what are you bringing to the table? It's always a two way street. Um, and so as you come out of school, a lot of times the people in school have um, the more up to date knowledge on technology or software or um, innovative ideas because you've been able to be in an environment of uh, a little bit less restriction and oftentimes and um, when we're working with clients every day we um, can be a little bit more jaded after a while or not dream as big and I think that knowing that you bring that to the table as a fresh um, a fresh out graduate uh, is not to be underrated and then a favorite project well I think that's a hard one to say I think the one that sticks with me probably the most, I didn't actually show um, my very first 
project that I was on from marketing all the way through construction administration was Grand Canyon University Arena. And it was a very big project. Uh, we were teamed with 360 Architects out of Kansas City. And I would say that was for me is probably not necessarily my favorite project, but definitely my most pivotal. Um, I remember very clearly a moment being out on the site and the contractor was asking about a detail we had to change in the moment. And I sketched out the new detail right there on the site. And it was the first time I'd ever done that. And I stepped back mentally and was like, wow, I actually know what I'm doing. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I have, I very just, I could like draw exactly where that happened. I remember that so clearly. Um, and so I think if you are transitioning from school into the workplace, really push to be a part of a project from beginning to end, because I think that is extremely critical in your growth and development and will make you a much better, uh, a much better employee and much better architect uh, way down the line, no matter which way your career goes. Great. Uh, so then we have a question from Michael Steers, who's, uh, in the second year of a, a three-year track through the MRC program. Uh, the question is, if the current state of online learning and communication continue, and I'll, I'll expand that to include uh, remote collaboration, uh, even after COVID, do you think it will affect how we perceive architecture? And do you think it will change the way that public spaces are designed and built? Yes and no. Um, I would say I hope so. I I always hope that our um, architecture and our, our public spaces evolve with, you know, the changing times and with the things that were faced. Um, at the same time, I don't think we should ever throw away what has been so successful historically. Um, we can look at spaces uh, in Spain, for example, plazas that have been around for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years that are still significantly more successful than um, new bright and shiny uh, plazas that get developed. So I think, yes, for public spaces, um, we will see an impact on how uh, we gather in the future. I think more than changing uh, how some public spaces get developed, I, I have the hope that we'll be innovative and creative in, in determining what new types of spaces might be public and what the, the term public might be in the future. Great. Uh, so then we have, uh, I'm going to actually skip Mallory's next question since she got basically three off right out of the gate. And uh, I'll jump to Eric Spaulding's first question. Uh, Eric is also in the second of uh, three year uh, pursuit. What was the most surprising thing that you experienced as you transferred from being a student to being a professional? Um, how much of a parent you have to be in the day-to-day -day job. Uh, a lot of what you end up doing is um, making other people communicate. So other consultants, consultants and other architects, other designers, um, designers all within the same team, project managers and designers. Uh, the key to any successful project is communication amongst the people working on it. And without that, uh, you're going to have a very, very painful process. And it really shocked me that I was having to do so much. Um, I hate to use the word mothering, but that's kind of what it feels like. <laughs> Great. Well, um, there's a question here that, that probably isn't a, a great question to direct uh, to you, which is, uh, what advice would you have for any undergrads who are not design majors, a history major in my case, uh, who wants to pursue a master's in architecture? How can we craft a relevant portfolio slash work having not formally studied design? Given that your undergrad was in landscape architecture, that one doesn't quite apply. So I'm, I'm just going to type in a response and um, I'm happy to uh, meet and better answer that one uh, through uh, portfolios that we've gotten from three plus students in the past who have a non-design background. Um, so Brennan Richards, who uh, is in the first year of his grad having uh, 
done the four-year uh, pre-professional degree with us as well, asks, how did the biomimicry or biomimetic thinking process and the design thinking process interact uh, with the design of a, or it says interact with an office setting? I'm not 100% sure what this one's asking. If it's asking that, we're, did we take into account um, our process uh, in terms of how biomimicry works in terms of our design process? Um, I can't say that we intentionally did that necessarily. Um, I would say that um, that was a very unique process and where not necessarily biomimicry per se, but we did make a very strong point of getting our partners out of New York into the desert, taking them on hikes, taking them um, to see various parts of the desert down to Tucson, taking them to biosphere um, and different projects around the area, but really getting them out in the desert to experience our environment, to, to feel a connection with the plant life here, the rock material that we have. And I think that had a very, very strong impact on, on the design and the process. It made us a much tighter, a much closer um, team. We were very, very tightly connected and that allowed for a lot more um, critical conversations and a lot of respect uh, evolved from those. Great. Uh, next, I'm going to jump to Haley's uh, question, which uh, she says, I love the approach to blending architecture and landscape. Uh, I practice currently and don't think this is always a common approach. Do you consider this something unique to your background? something that you learned from a specific uh, degree program, either the BSLA or the MARC, uh, or a particular vision from your firm, or is it all of the above? And then she just says, uh, beautiful work, thanks for the presentation. Well, I think that it is, um, I wouldn't say it's really unique to my background. I think that, um, or it's not unique to me, it's, it's I think, my background having been both landscape and land, landscape architecture and architecture um, definitely elevated my awareness and my passion for uh, this relationship. It's something that I felt very strongly about from the very beginning and something that I've pushed very hard on a lot of projects. Um, I always joke the very first thing that people want to cut are the trees when they're VEing and then they're mad that nobody wants to hang out outside their building. Um, so I've seen it, if you look at other people's work, um, both around town and, um, nationally, I like it. I use Weissman for as an example. That was one of the firms that I, uh, really honed in on during my thesis in terms of case study, um, architect and landscape architect duo, uh, locally Colwell Sheeler, very, very, very successful, uh, architect and landscape architect duo, um, and a lot of people I graduated with that had landscape architecture backgrounds in architecture. You know, if you look internationally, very rarely is there a separation between the two disciplines. And historically, um, as architects, um, using that name broadly, it people just focus maybe on one more than the other, but more or less were responsible for both. And so we've taken those and we've separated them for various reasons. And I think the, um, the merger of the two is really, really valuable and really enriches. And it doesn't mean that everybody has to have both backgrounds, but it means that you're going to have a better and more successful project if you are open-minded and you allow the consultant to participate in the design discussions from the very beginning, whether that be an interior designer or a landscape architect, but it's always about various scales of design. Excellent. I'm going to jump to uh, Elisa Santiago's question. Elisa is in the first year of our uh, graduate program, uh, having gone through the, the pre-professional degree as well. Uh, she says, hello, I'm an architecture student who's focusing on biophilic design and the impact that nature can have on the human within design. Do you recommend any projects, books, architects, and so on to look into? Considering my passions within this topic, I feel that I've missed out by not pursuing landscape architecture within my undergraduate degree, and I'm trying to further my knowledge in landscape architecture. 
Well, um, yes. <laughs> uh, I call. I, I did call out uh, Weiss and Frady, for example. Um, um, and I know there's many more, and for some reason my brain is not working. The the one woman, uh, Julia Kroller, um, that presented at the AI conference last year, um, not in architecture, does have a background in architecture, not currently, she's doing fashion design, but all biomimetic, um, biophilic design. Um, so really expanding beyond um, I don't don't beat yourself up for not having a landscape architecture background. Like I said, it's really just a matter of title at that point. You can expand into anything that you're personally passionate about. Um, and I will work on a on a more detailed list um, to get uh, Phil, but I I can't think off the top of my head for some reason. So apologies. Sorry, I, I didn't know that you would have a, a quiz uh, when you agreed to speak. <laughs> but, I've also always, fair statement, I've also been always terrible at names with, um, you know, that was not my strong suit in school. <laughs> so uh, Ninwe Jiso, who's also uh, in her first year of the MR program and, and who took a year off after uh, completing our undergraduate program, uh, asks, what is your perspective on mentorship? Uh, its effect on your personal career, if you had a mentor, and what is your recommendation on seeking one, uh, uh, seeking a mentor, especially in today's situation where a lot of interactions are remote or virtual? 1000% um, mentorship is critical. Um, I have been extremely fortunate um, to have a number of mentors. Um, John Kane at Architecton, obviously, Tom Riley at Architecton have been both instrumental in every developmental um, milestone that I've achieved. Uh, Diane Jacobs with Holly Street Studio has been an extreme asset and mentor to me throughout uh, many years. And I would say the common thread with um, my most successful mentorships um, are that they've happened kind of organically. We've tried uh, to create more structured mentorships. Uh, AIA often uh, can set you up in a very structured mentorship that um, if you reach out to Charnissa with AIA, she can set you up with uh, somebody that's open and able to mentor. Um, and they try to pair you according to similar um, ideals. But the best ones are the ones that happen organically. And um, by that, it's if you find a spark and a connection with someone that you're um, talking to, just grab hold of it. Um, make, you have to act, actively pursue that relationship um, and uh, allow it to kind of organically evolve over time. Um, and never settle for just one either. Uh, we are all richer by knowing many people and having a lot of diverse perspectives um, and we all become much better people don't be limited by age um, many people that have been mentors to me are younger than me um, eric sterner who a lot of these photographs and a lot of these projects worked with out of our office is a very strong mentor to me um, and he's significantly younger and so don't don't let labels and titles and other things kind of restrict you allow many allow yourself to get what you need from many different di different sources well um we've got about five minutes left and selfishly uh i want to ask a question but uh we've got like 13 open questions and i want to be really respectful of of your time uh so i'm going to ask my question and then i'll try to kind of collect some of the questions that have gone unanswered and, and get them to you uh later on Many of the folks on the call are in a course with me this semester, and, and so um, I'll have an opportunity to um, work with them to make sure that all of these questions get answered uh, later on. But uh, you, you talked uh, a number of times through the course of the presentation about collaboration, uh, either with Cole Shilor, the, the landscape architect that you worked with, uh, particularly on the Helios project and on this uh, current project. Uh, you talked a bit about that process of having to, in the field, on the fly, uh, 
sketch out for someone uh, a change to a detail. Uh, you talked about certain things that coordinate, like the uh, connecting the condensate uh, strategy from mechanical equipment to landscape. Uh, and I'm, I'm hoping that maybe you could just talk a little bit more about how you see uh, the value of learning to coordinate, <clears throat> not just, or collaborate rather, not just with other architects, but to, to be a kind of synthesizer uh, in, in projects, to connect everything from uh, an engineer's uh, strategy with uh, comfort systems and equipment to uh, that human connection that you talked about early on, about it's all about people. So I think for me, what I've noticed is that because I have a different undergraduate degree, um, because I experienced kind of the, the three plus process, um, and while landscape architecture isn't dramatically different, my husband, for example, had a political science undergraduate degree, and then we met in master's of architecture. So that's a much different perspective, but the same thing that he experiences, I think, is that because you have, we inherently had a different background, um, we come to the table understanding that there's a lot of different perspectives and that there's a lot of different expertise coming to the table. Um, so coming from our consultants. Um, and so I think when you have that baseline understanding that um, we're not the black capes in the room and that we, um, are just one element of the project uh, and that you invite those people into the process, um, asking the questions how to do, I mean, many things like the big, that condensate one at Cloud Song, that was a huge <laughs> undertaking um, for a very, very small portion of the project, um, working with people that have not done that before, uh, mechanical engineers that have not done something like that before, Colwell Sheeler had done something similar from another project. Um, and we had done something similar from another project, but never in that exact application, right? So understanding that everybody's bringing something to the table and allowing those people to voice their opinions or ask their questions probably even more critically um, is I think when I think of collaboration um, and why I, value it so much. I think it's because I'm inherently used to coming at it for as, if you will, the underdog as the three plus student, as the person without the background in architecture. And so that open mindedness of all of the various people involved in making a project successful, um, I think is the, the, the beauty of having that, that open background. That's uh, really, really great. And I hope we can uh, do this again. I would love to, the, the course that I'm teaching this semester is a, a professional practice oriented course. And we've got a number of folks who are gonna be coming in and, and speaking at various moments of, about various topics relative to professional practice. Uh, Ed Soltero is gonna come in, uh, Odromiak and Steve Jordan are gonna come in from Ryan and, and sort of talk about what it means to be in a firm where you've got multiple disciplines under one roof. Uh, but I, this, this is uh, uh, really great to see uh, sort of beautiful work to, to understand how your background in landscape architecture has uh, sort of informed your lens in architecture. I was really, uh, it's great to hear that uh, not only have you um, succeeded through mentorship through your career, but that you um, don't necessarily think of mentorship strictly as uh, a matter of age or experience that you're always learning and that we can learn from a lot of different people around us uh, in a lot of different ways. So this was really, really inspiring. I, I want to say thank you. Uh, I'm going to share my screen just for a, a brief you. moment for a, um, a couple of just quick details. For the folks who are on the call who are prospective students, uh, I just want to point out that we do have a, a, an application deadline at the end of next week, January 15th. So uh, that deadline is important for anyone who's going to be seeking scholarships or teaching assistantships. We're going to give most of those away uh, to students who complete uh, their applications by the priority deadline. And if you have any questions about that, please uh, email uh, designgrad.asu.edu. 
Uh, I should thank Corey and Christy, uh, as well as Ray Cabrera, who've been on the team that have helped uh, put together these alumni spotlight talks uh, this week. But uh, this has been uh, a really great talk. And thank you so much, Rachel, for all the inspiring work. Please keep it up. And uh, we will look forward thank to you. seeing you from you very soon. Uh, hopefully, we can all get a, a tour of ISTV7 uh, sometime after we get out of our, our current uh, safety restrictions. But uh, thank yeah. you again. I hope you have a good evening. I hope everyone has a good evening. And uh, this was really great. I'll, I'll see you soon. And safe travels coming back from Utah. Thank you. Thank right. you. Have a good evening. Take care. All right. Thanks all.